Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Groundwater Lunch Hour on Sustainable Management Criteria and Monitoring Networks. I'm going to turn it over to Herb to welcome us today, and then I'll walk through the agenda for tonight's presentation. So yes, to those who are here, welcome uh, to another, I think, my goodness, I think this is our ninth groundwater office hours um, that we've held um, thus far. Typically, we've held them at the lunchtime and gotten some participants there, and now we're holding it in the evening. So uh, it's good to, to have those who are here. So welcome. You have a, a bunch of the uh, people that are working on the groundwater sustainability plan in one part or another, um, and a, a couple of the um, the technical experts that work for the agencies that are members of the GSAs um, on as well. So welcome to everybody. And um, we have uh, uh, quite a few uh, fun things in store for you. Um, and looking forward to talking about chapter six and seven of the uh, draft GSP. Marisa, did you want me to go through uh, the contact setting or did you just wanna um, go through some other things first? Uh, why don't you introduce um your colleagues out that are on the line here today. Definitely. So um, we have uh, presenting the largest portion of today's discussion is going to be Karen Morgan from the City of Ceres. Uh, she's going to be talking about uh, the draft chapters six and seven um, that have been uh, released for public comment. And so she will have the, her presentation will be the bulk of what we discuss. Also on the line, we have we have um, Debbie Montalbano from TID. She's been uh, working, she's our groundwater department planning manager and she's been working on groundwater for, for however many years, I will not say to, to give her due sign of respect. Um, and, but she's also been working heavily on Sigma matters and Sigma implementation since it, it was signed into law in 2015, uh, 2014. Um, and so then also we have Michael Cook who heads up our regulatory affairs department. Um, he's he's on here as well, and he has a wealth of knowledge in, in both the, the city water um, uh, arena and now working for um, an irrigation district. And then also we have you know, our, our, our facilitator from Stantec, Marisa Perez-Reyes, and she is here to make sure we move along smoothly and answer all questions that come along. And then, and then um, Sarah, who's here, for, Sarah Wolf, who's here. Um, representing uh, representing uh, the east side, she's been involved uh, a lot in all of our coordination efforts as well as we work toward a GSP. And I think I hit everybody. I can't see everybody on my my list, but I think that's the bulk of of their Lacey yes. McBride. Oh yes, Lacey. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Lacey McBride, um, who is heading up um, the Merced County, um, you know, water water resources um, related to Sigma. She has probably one of the more tougher jobs of all of us. She's been in, working in multiple sub basins on multiple GSPs with multiple GSAs. And so um, she's here tonight uh, providing her knowledge and expertise on that. So that is the brief introduction. And good afternoon or good evening. I guess this is Matt Beeman with Merced Irrigation District. Hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hey. All right, thank you, Herb. I appreciate that round of introductions. I'll go ahead and walk us through the agenda and then uh, kick it over to Herb once again. So tonight we're going to be talking about the most recently released chapters of the Turlock Groundwater Sustainability Plan. Those would be chapters six and seven on sustainable management criteria and monitoring networks. So uh, first we'll have Herb explain just a bit of context about the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and the GSP. If you've been following this process, hopefully the information he shares won't be anything new. We'll, uh, I'll check in with the audience to see if anybody has any clarifying questions about the information covered at the beginning there. And then we'll turn it over to Karen for the majority of tonight's presentation. And uh, we'll answer any questions that come at the end and connect you with ways um, to submit comments and to continue to track uh, the GSP adoption process. So Herb, why don't you, I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks, Marisa. Um, yes. uh, in a second, I'm going to share my screen, but uh, I guess leading off, um, just um, firsthand where we're at in the GSP. Obviously, this has been a long process since 2014 when, when Sigma was passed into law. 
Um, we we crossed that first um, date threshold of, of June of 2017 to form our groundwater sustainability agencies um, or face state intervention. So we've done that, kudos to us, but the job wasn't done. Um, we have our two GSAs in the Turlock Subbasin, um, the East and the West Turlock Subbasin groundwater sustainability agencies. Um, but now we have to work through and create a plan um, uh, through 2000 or before January 31st of 2022. And so um, we're working on that. We've progressed nicely. We have, um, I think as of today, six of 10 draft GSP chapters have been released uh, for public comment, two of which are gonna be the discussion of, of tonight's presentation. And so we've progressed along, but we still have now. We're here. Are we at the end of October? We have uh, less than less than what uh, three, almost three months to to get this turned in uh, to the state. Um, and we believe we can do it. Um, and that's why we're here tonight. One of the reasons is to tell you where we're at on these chapters, and also to get some feedback for those who are interested. Um, and then one quick thing I want to do. And this is why Marisa let me share my screen. Is I'm just going to give everybody an overview real quick of our events page that we have uh, on TurlockGroundwater.org. Here's where we post everything for uh, our meetings and our events and our resources um, and workshops. Um, yeah, this is the home page. Notice if you scroll down, there's these stakeholder input opportunities. There's upcoming meetings and there's a list of recently held meetings. Um, and so um, we have availability to get like today, here's our office hours, here's the link to the meeting, here's the flyer, here's the meeting. Um, that was that was held earlier today, or that's going to be that's coming up, and so um, uh, we have all these things available, um, and you can click into any one of these and get information. Um, so, for example, you can click into here, and it takes you to our page. But also, a lot of people tend to like a calendar view. We have that available if you go to this calendar button at the top of the page, and it puts it in a lot more of a um, kind of an aggregated view. And um, of note, we can go all the way back to, I think our first meeting of, I think it was in February of 2017 was the first meeting of our GSA or, or the West Side GSA um, and the East as well was a couple of days behind that. You can go all the way back and view those meetings. And so you can come in here and a lot of times, a lot of people don't know this, it's a little known fact, um, but it's really nice. For example, if you click into any meeting, um, you will see um, and it may take a second to load up, but you'll see that we host through the, the, the um, benefit of Zoom, we're able to record a lot of our meetings and we're recording this one. Um, we actually put um, on our YouTube channel all of our uh, meetings that we, help, we hold. And so here for this special meeting on October 4th, here is, if you missed it, um, all the, the, the YouTube video um, that you could watch from that meeting and all the discussion and important information that comes from that. And so that's just a quick little overview of the calendar page. And I'll just make quick notes so I could make sure we're doing well on time. We also have a GSP page, which we might reference a little bit today. The GSP page is really your one-stop shop to um, view the draft chapters that have been released. Um, there's uh, a listing of our draft chapters. You could also view um, the previously submitted comments. We have five, I believe, comment letters thus far that have been submitted on the groundwater sustainability plan. So you can see what people are saying uh, related to our plan for public comment. There's also some additional information in there as well. And then another big thing that's mo most important at the top of the page, you can learn ways to comment on the GSP, either through uh, standard mail, through email, and also through a form on the site. And so that's a quick little website overview um, and some context setting of where we are and how we got here for um, the GSP. And so now I will stop and hand it back over. Great, hey, thank you, Herb. Karen, I'm going to go ahead and share screen with your presentation. Okay, thank you. Everybody hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Very good. Well, um, good evening. I'm Karen Morgan. I work for the City of Ceres. I'm also the Vice Chair of the West Herlock GSA. I've been lucky to be a part of this process from the very beginning, um, and it's been it's been a very long, laborious process, but um, it's been exciting, and I've I've learned quite a bit, and I'm excited to get to share with you Chapter Six and Chapter Seven tonight. 
Um, so we're going to be reviewing these chapters, the, the sustainable management criteria and the monitoring networks. Next slide. <clears throat> And actually, these couple of slides here are for me. So this is oh, okay. a reminder that this meeting is being recorded. Um, and as Herb just shared with us, the copies of the recording will be available on the website afterward. I just have a couple more here, Karen, uh, to go over the Zoom protocol. Sorry to um, undercut you here. So for those of you who are joining us live, you may submit questions at any time during this meeting. There's a, a Q&A button at the bottom of the page. Um, actually, because this is a regular Zoom meeting, I just believe it would be the, the chat function instead. Um, if you would prefer to ask your question live, you can also raise your hand and we will ask you to unmute at the appropriate time in the meeting, which will be after Karen's presentation. Um, and like I said before, you could also uh, type your question in the chat. Uh, and I just saw her put a message in there. So yes, um, that is where the chat is. Um, we are here to answer your questions today. So um, that is available to you, Karen. Yes, and I can see those as we're moving along here too. Okay, so tonight we're gonna be going over um, the chapters that are available now. We're also gonna be talking about the sustainable management criteria and how this is gonna be monitored. And then we're also gonna briefly discuss the public review process. Next slide. So as you can see here, um, we have chapters one, two, three, and four are available for review. Um, it's important to note that even though these are uh, past our comment period date, all of the chapters are open and still available for reviewing and comment. We do understand that releasing these chapters um, out of order and in batches can make the reviewing somewhat challenging. Um, but we also realize that we have a hard date coming up in January to get our uh, plans submitted to DWR. So it's really critical that as our chapters are completed, we get them out um, and open to the public as quickly as possible. And with that, we are also asking that we get comments back as quickly as possible so that we can work through them and thoughtfully consider and respond to the to the comments. So next slide. So for sustainable management criteria, there are six sustainable indicators uh, for the inclusion into the GSP. Of these six, one after serious discussion and consideration is not going to be included. Uh, seawater intrusion does not occur in the Turlock subbasin. That doesn't mean we're not going to be monitoring for it. It just means that it's at such a low risk that we don't find it necessary to include here into our plan for the subbasin. For the other five, we have selected minimum thresholds uh, working with uh, the TAC and with the public and other uh, agencies such as the Merced Irrigation District. We've been able to quantify undesirable results. We have also selected measurable objectives that will give us a target for more favorable conditions moving forward. Next slide. The sustainability considerations for the Turlock Subbasin. So of these five uh, sustainable indicators we can see here on our map, um, in the key it briefly defines each indicator, the little orange triangles. Um, these have been uh, appropriately scattered across the map where we have known problems or potential problems. Um, you can see in the center towards the east, there's an icon for chronic lowering of water levels. Um, there are areas that have concentrated uh, dots. Uh, many of these are more towards the west. These are the failed wells up to 2017. Um, those are also in consideration as the sustainability indicators. The red striped area uh, to the left is for land subsidence. Um, and this area may be more susceptible to subsidence. And along the river boundaries, we have our interconnected surface water icons for stream flow depletion. Next slide. So the sustainable management approach that we've taken, um, Sigma does not require us to correct issues before 2015. Uh, we're working hard to set criteria for future projected undesirable results that we recognize um, the need for uh, adapted management also. 
We've tried to select sustainable management criteria that eliminate current or projected undesirable conditions in the subbasin that we currently have now. Um, there's no obligation to go back in time. We're trying to make sure that the GSAs actively manage the basin responsibly and that the projects and management actions on both the demand and supply side of the water budget do not make matters worse. Uh, we've established robust monitoring networks, and over time, these will just continue to get better. We've got plans for new monitoring wells, um, a few that are going to be installed in the very near future. Um, it's required that we analyze and document for the GSP the implementation progress in our annual reporting. This is also a way for us to see how things are going. For our adaptive management approach, um, we'll be noting and responding to conditions as they change. The philosophy of adaptive management is also incorporated into our management actions. We will be reassessing the sustainable management criteria as the aquifer responds to our projects and management actions at the five-year mark. Next slide. Here, we've seen these hydrographs many times. Um, this is historical groundwater level declines in the Eastern Subbasin. Uh, the chronic lowering of water levels um, uh, are seen mostly in the east because there's no surface water for agriculture. The overdraft conditions have resulted in, in water level declines. Next slide. Here's an image of our future projected water budget for the Turlock Subbasin. We have a very, very long planning horizon of 50 years. Um, this image shows the water budget for the historic period. We've noted that there's an overdraft of 64,000 acre feet per year. Over time in the modeling, we saw this improve, but it was at, at the expense of the rivers with stream flow depletion. As we analyze um, with the local stakeholders and stakeholders and water right holders, um, stream flow depletions are found to be an undesirable result. So we've set the sustainable management criteria to avoid those projected stream flow depletions. Next slide. For historic water quality data, um, as you can see on this map, these are all wells that are monitored for um, various constituents. Um, and these are our, our six constituents of concern. Um, there's significant programs that are already out there that test and monitor for water quality, and we looked there to identify these six constituents of concerns. These are elevated concentrations over a widespread area and throughout the entire subbasin. It's important to recognize that the GSAs are not responsible for what has occurred prior to 2015, but we're required to be responsible for the degradation of water quality due to the projects and management actions that we're implementing. The sustainable management criteria for the subbasin has been set to prevent our actions from leading to the degradation of water quality. The GSAs will need to track the constituents of concerns on an annual basis through our annual reporting. We'll analyze for the mitigation of issues as they arise by using the data that's available and working with local agencies that may be imp impacted by projects and management actions. Most of these groups are members of the GSA, so that makes it really seamless for, for coordination. Next slide. You can see here, this is a map of land subsidence that can be found on the DWR website. Um, this land subsidence map, um, you can see the, the colored areas. The red is gonna be the worst. Probably the purple is, is far worse and the yellow is, is just the beginnings of land subsidence. Um, most of the sub subsidence is south of the Turlock Subbasin. We actually have no documented impacts from land subsidence. Um, the impacts we have seen to the south are due to declining water levels and drying out of compressible clays. On the, uh, the Corcoran clay that we have in our subbasin is on the western side. It was the red striped area on the previous slides. Once that clay dries out, the porous spaces in between, um, the porosity in between these particles will shift and collapse and they'll never be able to hold water again. And this is how the land subsides. We'll monitor for land subsidence, particularly by setting the um, minimum thresholds at historic water levels in the top of the Corcoran clay. Next slide. And here you can see the, um, the NSAR data for land subsidence. 
We've set water levels as historic lows as a proxy for a rate of decline of subsidence. We don't have a rate of decline in the, in the subbasin, so it makes it really challenging to set one. So we'll use the NSAR data for screening for land subsidence, and that will help us see if the area may be more susceptible than we've originally thought. And we can also use this data to adaptively um, adjust our monitoring program as needed. Next slide. And we have our interconnected streams. You can see this image here. Uh, many of us have seen it a few times before. The top stream on the left is um, a gaining stream. And what this means is as the river flows down, Hi, Karen. Uh, I'm having difficulty hearing you. Is anybody else? Of extractions back to ground, back to groundwater levels. So for the Next slide. Is my presentation still showing? It's not Hi showing. There. Um, I I'm it. about to get it back up. I do apologize okay. for that. That's okay. Would you like me to back up a little bit? So I've I've got an I've shared the screen. Could you um, let me know what slide you're on now? Um, that was the one that I was on. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let me you're just good. let me. Am I good? Okay. Yeah, I'll you're good. Then. Yeah. Okay. So the minimum threshold approach. Uh, you know, setting these minimum thresholds, a lot of work went into this. Um, this is a table here that summarizes the approach we've taken for the five applicable sustainability indicators. The first row on the table is the GSP minimum threshold metric. So for the chronic lowering of water levels, the metric we chose is groundwater levels. Um, the reduction of groundwater and storage requires an actual volume as a metric, and this volume of water would be the sustainable yield. To do this, we've used groundwater levels as a proxy, and we'll use the same monitoring network to track this. Water quality is related more to the number of supply wells that might be impacted by our management actions. Um, so for the constituents of concern, which are mainly found in supplies wells, we set the most rigorous standard for the drinking water maximum contaminant levels. Land subsidence must be monitored by rate of extent. To, um, to do this and to, to demonstrate that water levels uh, remain close to the historic lows, uh, this way we can avoid subsidence. Water levels will be used as a proxy to monitor for this one as well. Uh, we're able to use water levels for the sustainable yield and the sustainable yield to monitor for stream flow depletion Maintaining water levels are intended to protect um, the stream beds from um, the stream flow depletions from occurring. Next slide. So this is a pretty busy slide, but it's actually uh, very helpful. Um, this table shows the summary of the undesirable results and the minimum thresholds. Um, in chapter six, there's some very heavy regulatory and policy um, reading for your pleasure in chapter six and it describes how all of these have been chosen. Um, you can use this as a guide as you read through the chapters that can help keep things organized. Um, and just take note here, the highlighted areas for the fall of 2015 groundwater levels, and then the 2014, just to monitor the Merced River. Um, it, was, it was a better year to monitor that, a far more protective. Next slide. Okay, so um, setting our MTs and, and monitoring networks. Um, for the Western Principal Aquifer, we've got 18 wells, 16 are CASGEM wells, um, two are proposed with permitting underway. And you can see here on the Western Upper Principal Aquifer, we're monitoring for the chronic lowering of water levels, the reduction of groundwater and storage, and inelastic land subsidence. Next slide. Karen, what's CASGEM? CASGEM is, um, Debbie would be able to describe this better than me. There's, there's wells that are set up for a water 
level monitoring program and they're they're um, they're measured every two years so it's DWR's um, ability to contour water levels does that sound right Debbie um, yeah it's a statewide uh, uh, groundwater monitoring network and so um, all of the different agencies within um, and sub-basins within the California um, uh, area uh, submit information semi-annually to the Department of Water Resources through the CASGEM um, network of wells. And, and so then they develop contours to evaluate how the conditions are within, within the state. That CASGEM network is, is then now transitioning under SIGMA to um, the SIGMA process. And so CASGEM will go away eventually and all of that information is being absorbed into the SIGMA process. So as I understand what you're saying is what's important about this is that there's, because it was a, an ex existing well being used in a different program, you actually have quite a bit of information compared to say a new, new proposed permitting wells. Is that, is that what this means? Yes. Yeah. Great, thank yeah. you. Formerly, we we had the Turlock Groundwater Basin Association, which was the group of um, folks that met um, uh, semi-annually and reported their uh, water levels for CASGEM. Correct, Debbie? Yeah. Can you okay. still hear me? We can. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't mean to sidetrack you, but- um, You're I fine. I'm uh, I just real sensitive to, we use a lot of these words and if you don't live in groundwater all the time, it's um, sometimes you don't know what yes. they mean. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for the acronyms. They become words over time to me. Yeah. Um, okay, so next well, or not next well, next slide. I've got my mind on water here. Okay, for the Western Lower Principal Aquifer, you can see here on the bottom of the slide as well, the sustainability indicators that we're monitoring for. And again, it's chronic lowering of water levels, reduction of groundwater and storage, and inelastic land subsidence. And for this monitoring network, we, there's eight wells, 14, four multi-completion wells, one USGS well that we're working on gaining access. Um, three wells will be installed for um, Proposition 68 uh, grant funding. The permitting process is um, currently underway um, and we'll be putting more in in the future. Next slide. Okay, for the Eastern Principal Aquifer, there's a pretty robust um, monitoring program. And again, you can see the indications on the bottom there by the key. Um, there's 21 wells, a mixture of those CASGEM wells, multi-completion uh, city wells, and some recently accessed wells. There's also two uh, Proposition 68 grant wells that will be um, going in soon, and then three new wells uh, for the DWR TSS program are planned. Um, next slide. Okay, for water quality monitoring sites, you can see here that this map is littered with dots. Um, these are a significant number of wells that are monitored for all sorts of water quality issues. Most of these are, are in urban areas. Um, and so for water quality, we, we do not need to install new wells. Um, some of the wells for the constituents that they monitored will possibly change over time just due to um, the State Water Resources Control Board's monitoring programs for those constituents. So you can see here the constituents of concern for arsenic, there's 87 wells, nitrate 339, TDS 59, uranium 34, for 123 TCP there's 80, and PCE 74. So we'll be using all of this data moving forward. Okay, next slide. For monitoring the interconnected surface water, this map is pretty sparse. If you look pretty closely, you'll see that there's six wells on the Merced River. There's three wells along the Tuolumne River that are pretty far away. Um, and then there's three wells on the San Joaquin River. So we realize that there's um, data gaps here. We'll be um, working to fill those over time. Uh, with, with more monitoring wells. Next slide. 
Okay, so here's the picture as a whole. This is our monitoring network overall. There are 52 total representative monitoring wells and 52 additional Sigma wells for tracking. Those are the um, CASGEM wells, I believe. Um, so there's our the picture as a whole. Uh, interim milestones is the next slide. So selecting these interim milestones was, um, was very challenging. It's the last sustainable management criteria for chapter six. Um, so we cannot start all of our projects on the first day that we adopt our plan. Um, we, we've given ourselves the opportunity to get all of our ducks in a row. While we're doing that, water levels may continue to decline, especially with the forecasted droughts um, and the one that we're currently experiencing over the next five years. Even with um, our robust projects in play, it's gonna take time for our aquifer to respond. So the first interim milestone we've set for the year of 2027, and as you can see, it's below the minimum threshold. Um, this might not look quite right at first, but if I can explain, it might make some more sense. So we're expecting the same rate of water level to, of decline that's occurred over the last several years to continue to, to, to decline over the next five years. So even with all of our projects, and the time it takes for the basin to respond, it's gonna, it's gonna continue to decline. And we've allowed room for this. This is our guide, guide path to our measurable objective. And this will not put us out of compliance. And I can show you how this looks on the next slide. So this is a hydrograph of a, a monitoring well. Um, you can see on the red dot, the location of the well close to the river. So this is what it's gonna look like on a hydrograph. There's a rate of decline from 2013 to 2020. So we use that rate of decline and projected that out for another five years. And that places us at the location of the blue line, the interim milestone at the very bottom. So for 2027, this puts that 19 feet below the minimum threshold. So this is our, this is the, the time that we've, we've bought. Um, we, we know that we're going to continue to decline, but our project and management actions, once those are in place, we'll see that bounce back. Can you go back one slide? So you can see here our interim, interim milestone number one, and um, it's in the pink and below that minimum threshold line. But interim milestone number two is the minimum threshold, and that as we continue to work through our five-year increments in time, we will get closer to our measurable objective for 2040. And I might even be retired by then, we will see. Okay, next slide. Adaptive management. We cannot say enough about adaptive management. Adaptive management is very important to the implementation of the plan and the projects and our management actions. We're using the best available science and technology and data that we have, but of course there's uncertainties. The implementation of the supply and demand side projects and management actions that are based on adaptive management and as data comes in, we'll refine our course. Each year there will be annual reports as well as updates to this plan every five years. This will be our ongoing process and over time, many new ideas are gonna emerge. Um, we have new technology being invented every day so as time goes on, we will find more projects to help continue to bring our basin into sustainability. Um, next slide. Questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that presentation, Karen. Um, You're welcome. We are going to turn this over to the audience for questions. Um, just a brief reminder, um, you can ask your question live or you can submit it in the chat. Um, I know many of the people that are on this call are um, actually people that were involved with putting the GSP together. So I don't know that we are really going to have that many questions tonight, but um, you can ask them live or you can ask them non-verbally. Also, if you're watching this recording online, you can submit a question um, to the appropriate email address, which we will provide at the end. I'm also open for corrections if my colleagues see there needs to be. It's a 
quiet audience tonight. Uh, you got a shout out. Uh, oh, you already saw it. Thank you, Sarah. All right. So if there aren't questions tonight, I think I'll turn it over to her to go ahead and um, talk about next steps for the GSP. And um, he'll, oh, actually, here we go. We have a question from Allison, which reads, regarding the needed wells along the Tuolumne River, how will you find willing landowners to install those wells? Well, I think you just have to perform outreach. We'll have to go and knock on doors. Um, the, the first order of business will be trying to find the, the locations where we have data gaps. And once we find where we have data gaps, we'll be able to find locations where we wanna use some of these wells uh, or install some new wells. Uh, we'll also be able to use um, data from our neighbors uh, for example, Strigba is installing monitoring wells on the northern side of the Tuolumne River. So if we could possibly have monitoring wells um, on the opposite sides or near, we can use um, both of those wells to monitor groundwater levels. So we'll, we'll be able to, to coordinate with our neighbors for even more data collection. Does that answer your question? Hello, yes, so what were the two wells that are going to be on the northern side of the Tuolumne and where are they? Um, I don't have specific information um, for the, the Strigba GSP uh, process, um, but we have heard with our um, consultant Phyllis that they are working on, on putting some in so that that data will become available soon and we could share that with you once we know. Thank you, that would be helpful. We're concerned about the area up where the salmon spawn and that's um, from about, well, most of the fish are spawning from Peasley Creek and upstream, but there are fish spawning down as far as Roberts Ferry, not as many, but so we would be interested in like the, the first 10 miles of the Tuolumne below LaGrange. Okay, well, thank you for that information. Allison, do people know how to get a hold of you? I think some do. Um, our comments are the Tuolumne River Conservancy, and I think I gave contact information on that. Super, thank you. Yeah, Marisa, if you don't know, this is Michael from TID. Um, Allison's a great participant in our Tuolumne River Technical Advisory Committee, her along with other um, groups that are helping to restore the Tuolumne. So if you need contact information for Allison and her group, I can help you with that. Excellent, thank you for adding that, Michael. So Sarah, do you have advice for the group? Um, anything specific you'd like me to give advice on? I don't have anything. <laughs> no, yeah, just in general. Um, one of the things the group's been working on is trying to find ways of sharing information um, that, that's helpful. Um, and I think one of the other things is they really wanted to get the word out. And, you know, obviously, um, we've got a, just a handful of folks here tonight, but are there things that um, they could be thinking about that would help get the word out or ways of presenting things that would help the public understand more about what's going on? Yeah, I think if they, um, the more that they can engage with these meetings or any of the other public meetings that we're having um, and the Eastside Turlock GSA, we're going to be having um, more detailed briefings with the various water districts and the counties, and I know the counties are going to schedule some um, meetings for areas that they represent. We'll be meeting with the East Side Water District and explaining more detail of the GSP as well as Belico Cortez. So engagement in those water districts, but we are also open to coming to any organization or um, community meeting that might be interested in hearing um, more details about the GSP. So reaching out directly to East Herlock or I'm sure to West Herlock 
um, for your community organization, we'd be happy to share information and um, do a presentation if necessary or if interested. If you have questions, you may ask. Great, thank you, Sarah. How about you, Matt? Any, any um, advice? Oh, advice. Um, no, I, th you know, I think um, this is the this is the home stretch, and and the group is working extremely hard to to meet the deadlines, and um, you know, it's from not just an agency perspective, but the public perspective, it's um, it's important for us to try to keep people from burning out, um, and so I don't know, maybe it's just a uh, hope for encouragement for the folks that are here to to stick with it, and um, we're almost there. And then the fun part comes after. So, thank you, Matt. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Matt. And and thank you, Karen. Too, was a, you did a really good job. It's a it's a tall order. So appreciate you. <laughs> thank you. It. Appreciate it. You're next, I think, right? Whatever you want. <laughs> All right, are there any other questions from the group? If there are no more questions, we, we may decide to uh, adjourn early, but before we do that, I have a few slides from Herb that um, we'd like to share. All right, do you want me to just jump right in, right on in, Marisa? Uh, yes, please. Why don't you um, take us on? There's um, this information here, and then there's one more slide with the schedule. Perfect. Okay. Well, um, so obviously, you know, Karen did a great job presenting um, what is the, what are the types of things, the highlights, if you will, in chapters or draft chapters six and seven of the GSP. Um, and so, you know, now that that is something that's that's out, um, and we we're looking for comments on that those specific chapters through November nineteenth. Um, you know, it's it's an obvious question. You know, how do I access those? You know, how do I comment on those? And so, I gave a quick little overview of the site previously, but if you just go to sherlockgroundwater.org/gsp, you'll see this page that's listed here on the right. Or I'm sorry, on the left, <clears throat> and on that page. Um, it provides you the three ways, either, uh, you know, United States Postal Service mail, um, email, um, you know, emailing a PDF um, or e just a, a, an email with your comments in the body of the, the email itself is perfectly sufficient. Um, and, and that's also in the chat that Marisa put it in there as well. So thank you for that. Um, and then we also have forms on our website too. If someone just wants to type into a form or a web form, it's kind of a little bit of an archaic way, um, but it's still available for those who, who maybe, uh, maybe don't have an email or anything like that to submit comments. And so you could type in your comments. Um, you know, that's the thing too, is we're not necessarily looking for, we don't need to have comments be super specific. I mean, it's nice that they are, if you say, I looked at this page on this chapter of the draft GSP, and I have this to say about it. Um, that's certainly, you know, perfectly fine, and we like that um, specificity. But if you just have a general comment um, on on a chapter um, on some sustainable management criteria that that Karen went over tonight, um, we're certainly looking to have that, and then we could try and find a way um, if there's if there's something in there to improve the plan or make the plan better. Um, to address that um, in our own way as we take that under under advisement. And so um, certainly looking for all types of comments. Um, and specifically here, Karen presented on, on the sustainable management criteria chapter and the monitoring networks chapter, um, chapter six and seven. And so we're looking for comments on those through November 19th. Um, we put that in there. We prefer them by then so that we could address those comments directly. Um, but the reality of it all is through the, the, the 10 different chapters we're going to have for the GSP, um, we will do our best to take comments um, as, as soon as we get them at any time. So, um, you know, if they come after, that's okay. We may not be able to address them in this go round of the GSP. It may end up being in the next five year update, um, but we certainly want to hear them uh, and we certainly want to have a chance to, to reflect those in the GSP. Here now we see the chapter release schedule. Um, right now you see where we're at. 
Um, we're very, getting very close to the finish line here. Um, the project uh, next up will be the project and management actions chapter, along with an um, implementation support activities chapter. Um, and most likely at the same time, the outreach and communications chapter will be sometime in November, uh, most likely early to mid-November, as we talked a little bit about um, earlier today at our technical advisory committee meeting. And so um, when that happens, we start to work with our member agencies to get um, their councils and boards up to speed in December. Um, and then we do a few final, 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 um, final revisions and, and finalize a document. And then we go to our GSA boards in early January um, before we, we work to get that adopted and submit to the Department of Water Resources before the, the January 31st deadline. And so we're working toward that path. And um, if people have comments, now is perfectly the time to do it. We have um, more than 60% uh, of the GSP um, released for, for comment and more to come in the next probably two to three weeks. So that is where we're at on the schedule and we're almost there. It's been a long process, but uh, um, but we're getting close. And I think that is it for me. Um, I, I'll just mention also too, you know, to go to our site at turlockgroundwater.org slash GSP. We also have social media channels um, that people can uh, check out on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and those are on the site as well. Um, and just um, the big thing would be for those who aren't involved thus far, for those who are watching this recording, uh, who stumbled across it, um, to sign up for our interested parties list. There is a, a button, a blue button at the top of our website that says get involved, or actually I think I might have changed it to get our emails to be a little bit more direct. Um, and people can click that and get signed up. We have some 380 people thus far that are part of that list that are getting our regular emails. That is the quickest way to learn about meetings that are coming up, to learn about GSP chapters that have been released and ways to comment. And just it's our best way to communicate directly to people um, all in one uh, one shot. And so I just uh, uh, mentioned that because it's a, a good way to encourage people to sign up to get the most recent information. I know we hate a lot of emails coming to us. We only send about maybe three to four a month, maybe, um, especially now that we're ramping up things, probably three to four a month. We used to do maybe one or two. So uh, it's not as bad as, as those local places you shop at that send you emails every day if you've done business with them. So um, that is it for me, unless there's any questions or any um, comments about uh, ways we're moving forward. Oh, I believe that is all. And uh, I'll go ahead and bring this meeting to a close. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you, Karen, again, for the presentation. And uh, we hope you guys have a lovely rest of your evening. If you are watching this online, um, check out the website. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Tom. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.